So Nick Adams is a three-time best-selling author, commentator, and served as a surrogate for the Trump White House. Born and raised in Australia, Adams is a legal, legal immigrant to America. Imagine that, played by the rules. Receiving a rare, extraordinary ability green card, his book, Green Card Warrior, detailing his journey to America, received special distinction in March 2017 with President Donald Trump declaring it a must read. It was the first time in history of, the United, of a United States sitting president who ever endorsed a book. On August 25th, 2017, President Trump took to Twitter to praise Adams' previous book called Retaking America, resulting in several news outlets declaring him the president's favorite author. <laughs> he received several major honors, including honorary Texan, and that's hard to get, I've been trying for years, uh, by Governor Perry, uh, honorary Oklahoman by Governor Fallon, and Kentucky General, Kentucky Colonel from uh, Governor Bevan. Adams has appeared on virtually every major television and radio program, and his work has been published in newspapers around the world. In uh, the United States, he has spoken at conventions, corporate meetings, military bases, universities, high schools, and churches in 30 states. Abroad, he has given major addresses in England, Germany, and South Korea. Adams is the founder and executive director of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, which is also referred to as FLAG, F-L-A-G. How, how cool is that? I wonder how long you worked on that uh, acronym there, Nick. <laughs> um, and you can, his website is www.flag.org flagusa.org, F-L-A-G-U-S-A.org, an organization that visits elementary, middle, and high schools to provide training to increase patriotic pride and bridge the major civics defi uh, deficiency that currently exists. He is a survivor of childhood cancer, given at the, a given at the age of 16 months just a 5% chance of survival. Pretty cool. Adams earned both undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at the University of Sydney. He was publicly elected the youngest deputy mayor in Australian history in Sydney at the age of 21. So please join me in welcoming Nick Adams to the stage. Much appreciated. That's okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor, pleasure, and privilege it is to be here with each and every single one of you. I want to extend my most profound gratitude to Jennifer, to Jen. I do remember that great moment in Indianapolis uh, three years ago now when we met. And here we are, three years later, a pandemic later, but finally we managed to make it happen. A big thank you as well to Kurt, who I know was also instrumental in ensuring that I could be here with you today. What an honour, pleasure and privilege it is to be in the land of the free and the home of the brave. In the world's exceptional nation, in civilization's indispensable country. And to top it all off, if all of that weren't enough, in the state with the greatest governor of them all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin tonight by sharing with you a story. And as I share this story with you, I invite you to momentarily close your eyes and really imagine what it is that I am sharing with you. It's December of 1985. Two parents are at their wit's end. Something is wrong with their 16-month-old child. For months, they've been to doctor after doctor, pediatrician after pediatrician, but nobody can tell them what is wrong. 
One night, with their child even more unwell than usual, they head to the emergency ward of the local children's hospital. The ward is almost deserted, but there's one overnight doctor there, a young man with a smiling face and an accent. As he looks the child over, his smile quickly evaporates. He tells the parents that he can't be sure, but he has a hunch that he may have seen this before. And he fears that their child has a very rare form of childhood cancer. He prescribes a certain set of tests and commands the parents to return the very next morning to have those tests conducted. The very next day, the parents' worst fears would be confirmed. Their child had stage four neuroblastoma, a very rare form of childhood cancer indeed. The parents were mine. The child was me. The doctor, it turned out, was an American. The cause of neuroblastoma remains unknown to this day, with only one in 100,000 children being diagnosed with it each year. Notoriously difficult to diagnose when it is, the tumour has almost always already metastasized. A child, an infant, a baby with stage 4 neuroblastoma is given just a 5% chance of life. Only 1 in 20 survive. For three and a half years, I underwent chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and an operation. And through the healing hands of God, our master physician, I defied the odds and lived. It was the instincts of an American doctor, fresh out of college, just in Australia for a summer residency, that proved crucial to my survival. So I'm fond of saying that I haven't only studied American exceptionalism, I've lived it. In fact, I'm alive because of it. <laughs> Once I became of an age where I could properly comprehend the magnitude of my escape, I resolved to never ever waste a single second of a minute of an hour of a day of a month of a year ever. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you here at the AMAC Action National Conference that I have very much lived up to that self-commitment. I was the valedictorian of my school. I was publicly elected to political office at the age of 19, becoming one of the youngest ever elected councilmen in Sydney, Australia. The first election I ever voted in, I voted for myself. <laughs> it's all been downhill since then, let me assure you. On the 13th of September 2005, just eight days after my 21st birthday, I was elected the youngest deputy mayor in Australian history in Sydney, a record which still stands to this day. I am a four-time New York Times best-selling author, and I have the distinction of being the first author, as Jen pointed out, to ever have a book endorsed by a sitting president of the United States. And that honour was bestowed upon me on the 3rd of March 2017, when President Trump took to Twitter, where else? <laughs> to declare that my book, Green Card Warrior, was a must read and I was a great American. He followed it up six months later with another tweet, endorsing my previous book, Retaking America, Crushing Political Correctness. It does sound like his kind of book, doesn't it? <laughs> Making me, at the time, the only author to have had two books endorsed by a sitting president. And then in 2020, when my book Trump and Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization, with a former by former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, was released, well, suffice to say that President rather enjoyed that comparison. And I earned myself no less than nine separate tweets, all of which led to a most auspicious occasion when, for once in its life, the New York Times did not report fake news when they declared me to be the president's favourite <laughs> author. So that's been quite the journey. Many of you will recognise me from television. I am a Fox News and Fox Business commentator. I have spoken now in 42 of the 50 states, given keynote addresses in six different countries, President Trump appointed me to the board of the Smithsonian, 
a position that I will hold until 2026. So far, the greatest honour in my life. I am recognised worldwide as an authority on American exceptionalism. In fact, I have decided to dedicate my life to promoting, protecting and perpetuating what I consider to be the greatest idea ever, the American idea. <laughs> to top all of that off, if all of that weren't enough, on the 29th of July 2016, after four and a half long, torturous and arduous years, including a stint on the no-fly list, courtesy of the Obama administration and John Kerry State Department, and almost $50,000 later, I finally legally immigrated to the United States of America. There you go. And after five years, which was July 29, 2021, leave about six months in there for the administrative bureaucratic process. On the 20th of December, 2021, almost six months ago, I became a US citizen. So what is it that I believe in? I believe in God, personal responsibility, the sanctity of human life, limited government, a strong national defence, the right to bear arms, the state of Israel. Up there with all of those things, ladies and gentlemen, I believe in the United States of America. And if there is one take-home message that I have for you tonight, there's one thing that I want you to remember when you go upstairs later this evening and rest your head on your hopefully cold pillow. It is this, despite the undeniable, indisputable and incontrovertible problems, challenges, threats and realities currently afflicting the United States of America, this is still easily, by far and away, hands down, head and shoulders, the greatest country in the history of the world. Every single time, every single time I speak to an elementary school, middle school, public high school or college audience, I look those students in the eyes and I tell them that the day that they were born in the United States of America or the day that they moved permanently to the United States of America is the day that they won the lottery of life and they got the most incredible the most amazing, the most remarkable, the most sensational head start on anyone and everyone everywhere else. This is the best country in the world to be born in, to live in, to work in, to start a business in, to grow a business in, to realise a dream. This is the only country in the world where you can colour outside of the lines and not be punished. This is the only country in the world where you can blaze a trail and leave a legacy. This is the only country in the world where success is not yet resented, but still admired and aspired to. This is the only country in the world where your first language or last name means absolutely nothing. This is the only country in the world where anybody can rise above any set of circumstances and go on to achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve. And this is the only country in the world where failure is not fatal, where you can fall down 5,000 times, but if you've got grit, determination and hustle, you can get up 5,001. Thomas, <laughs> Thomas Edison had 1,000 cracks at the light bulb. Colonel Sanders had his recipe for fried chicken rejected 1,009 times before he got a taker. Abraham Lincoln lost his first six elections. Walt Disney, our neighbour tonight, went bankrupt twice, almost three times. Same story with Henry Ford. 
P.T. Barnum's first two circuses were abject failures, yet he went on to become the greatest showman. Again and again and again, the lesson, the theme throughout American history has been that those with passion, those with perseverance, those with persistence, those that refuse to yield end up leaving a legacy well beyond their time on this earth. You see, America is special because America is not just a country, not simply a stretch of land, not merely a geographic entity. America is an idea. It is an ideal, a notion, a value system, an improbable and daring experiment that actually remains equally as improbable and daring today. It's the hope that banishes all hopelessness. It's the shot that was heard around the world and still is. There are four ways that a nation is said to be exceptional. Culturally, militarily, economically and scientifically. And on each of those four measurements, in almost 5,000 years of recorded human history... And you want to hear the kicker? I know Kurt does. We're less than 5% of the world's population. We're less than 5% of the world's population. America has dominated those four spheres to an extent previously considered impossible. But none of that success, none of that power, none of that might, none of that influence, none of that wealth, none of it just happened. None of it was accidental. None of it was incidental. No, to the contrary. All of it was extraordinarily deliberate, extremely intentional. You see, the most brilliant men to have ever walked this earth were our founders who understood that the way to unlocking human ingenuity, the way to unleashing human creativity, the way to driving human accomplishment was to make sure that men and women were as unencumbered as possible by the need for government approvals and red tape. It's for precisely the same reason that the United States of America has ascended to the position of guardian of liberty as the custodian of civilization. I want you to contemplate for just a fleeting moment what the world might look like without the United States of America. North Korea would invade South Korea. Taiwan would be overrun by China. War, maybe nuclear, would break out in the Middle East. Russia would attempt to rebuild the Soviet Empire. Islamic terrorists would act with complete impunity. Tyrants in North Africa would run around even more mercilessly than what they already do. Cataclysmic natural disasters would have no concerted, coordinated response effort. Individual liberty would gradually diminish and ultimately become extinct. That's what a world without the United States of America looks like. And that's why it's in the interest of everyone, no matter who you are, where you come from, what you do, which one of the new 57 different genders you choose to identify with, <laughs> what bathroom you elect to use, even if you have never so much as even set your little toe on American soil. It's in your interests that America be as robust as self-confident, as assertive, and as healthy as possible. Why? Because the equation is very simple. What is good for America is good for the world. Amen. When America is strong, the world is strong. When America is weak, the world is a weak and dangerous place. Now, that's not my hypothesis that I've scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin after a few too many pina coladas at the Wyndham Garden Resort in Orlando <laughs> by the Lazy River. We're living that reality real time right now as we have leaders at the highest levels of the federal government that have been insistent on ensuring that America retreats from its traditional role of leading from the front and instead is now leading from behind. The result? The world is an infinitely more dangerous place precisely because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, political correctness is killing 
the United States of America. You see, here's the thing. Most people think that political correctness is simply an imposition on speech. Just something that tells us what we can say and what we can't say. Well, that would be egregious enough with our proud tradition of the First Amendment. But I'm here to tell you that political correctness is infinitely more than that, way more than that. Political correctness is a mindset. It's a mentality. It's a cultural attitude that says that you should strive for mediocrity and not greatness, that you shouldn't colour outside of the lines lest you be punished, that you should resent those that have differentiated themselves professionally, financially, or in some other fashion more so than you. In fact, political correctness mandates that success and achievement be a measurement of how much butt you kiss as opposed to how much butt you kick. What could be more un-American and anti-American than that? Political correctness is an intellectual tyranny, a totalitarian ideology, a choking conformity that strips us of our individualism, eliminates our patriotism, removes our self-confidence. And in doing so, political correctness is transforming the American dream into the European and Australian nightmare. And why on earth would we want to follow the trajectories of the once grand nations of Europe, now with demography in decline, Islam in the ascendancy, where churches are being routinely transformed into nightclubs? Those cultures, those societies, those polities have become pedestrian and vanilla and grey and moribund, dull, there's no passion, there's no innovation, there are no inventions. That's not the future that we want for the United States of America. That's not the future that we want for our children and our grandchildren and our great, 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 great grandchildren. And that's certainly not the future that our founders had envisioned for us. You see, America is complex. It is complex. But American exceptionalism... It's stunningly simple. It's individualism, not collectivism. Patriotism, not relativism. God, not government. Faith, not secularism. It's equality, but it's not equality of outcome. It's equality of opportunity. It's e pluribus unum, not radical multiculturalism. It's about being bold, not being bland. These are the virtues and values that have differentiated the United States of America from every other society on this earth in almost 5,000 years. But proponents and advocates of political correctness would seek to eliminate every single one of those points of differentiation, rendering America just another country, just another place. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very personal to me. I chose to come to the United States of America. I came to make, not take, to give, not receive, to join the place, not complain about it or change it. I came because I knew that this was the greatest country. I came because I knew that this was the place that would afford me the most freedom and the most opportunity to achieve the dreams that God put in my heart. But I also came here in no small, insignificant or insubstantial way to make sure that the United States of America does not turn out like the country I felt I had to leave. Most Americans, like most people around the world until recently thought that people in Australia boxed kangaroos by day and wrestled crocodiles by night. But anybody that's had access to a television set over the last 12 months will know that the international perception of Australia is vastly different to the domestic reality. And the truth is that Australia has always been an infinitely more European place in instinct, in values, in proclivity. 
America truly does stand alone when it comes to culture, values, and setup. And that is why I am on a mission to make sure that every single American, from north to south, east to west, and everywhere in between, knows how lucky and how fortunate and how blessed they are to call America home. But particularly our young, especially those that will be bequeathed with the most awesome responsibility conceivable, keeping the grand American experiment alive. I want them to know how lucky and how fortunate and how blessed they are to call America home. That's why I set up an organisation called FLAG, the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, one of the fastest growing non-profits in America today. FLAG is about two very simple things. Number one, teaching civics, and number two, putting patriotism back in K-12 public schools. We do it three ways. Number one, through classroom visits. Number two, through the creation and distribution of kid-friendly resources relating to the founding documents. And number three, through professional development training for teachers, where we teach teachers how to teach civics the way that it was taught to all of you. In 2017, FLAG teamed up with interns from the late Justice Antonin Scalia's office and we got the United States Constitution into plain, simple, easy to understand English that even a fifth grader can comprehend. We launched it live on Fox News with a special three hour event on the Fox News Plaza on Constitution Day. This resource has been a rocket ship for us. On the heels of the stunning success of the Students' Constitution, we released the Students' Declaration of Independence, Students' Selected Readings of the Federalist Papers, the Students' Guide to the Electoral College. I, I am beyond delighted to be able to tell you that we now have, as of April last year, more than 1.2 million public school students with at least one of these four resources. <laughs> Next month, our latest resource will be coming out. It is called Freedom Versus Socialism, a high schooler's guide. Uh, we've released recently a parent and grandparents guide so the best way of, because the best way to circumvent all of the cultural Marxist poison being fed to our children in public schools is by dealing with these matters around the dining table. We also have our teacher's guide. Uh, it will not surprise you to know, given what we do, that FLAG is also leading the fight against critical race theory. And... This particular booklet is being distributed by the hundreds of thousands to concerned communities all across the country where we are equipping mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, everybody possible on how to identify CRT, how it's likely to be disguised and what you can do to fight it. FLAG has also got our FLAG Schools Pledge where we get schools to commit to doing three very simple things. Number one, display an American flag in every classroom. Number two, recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day. And number three, sing the national anthem before all major sporting events. And as of last Friday afternoon, as of yesterday, we now have 8,759 schools signed up to that commitment nationwide. FLAG is also leading the way in social media. For those of you that do not already follow us on several platforms, I suspect a couple of you here will have been booted off, one or two. But that's okay, we're on just about every single one that there is. Uh, if you don't already follow Nick Adams, if you don't already follow FLAG, please make sure that you do that, because as you would know, the primary source of information today, particularly for young people, particularly for those that are going to be bequeathed with that incredible responsibility of keeping the American dream alive. They are getting all of their information 
from social media. A flag has also declared war on this idea that every student has got to go to college. I went to college. I got two degrees. I had a really good time. You can ask my mother. But not everybody is made for college. And we need plumbers and electricians and machinists and carpenters and welders and entrepreneurs. And there are some really good reasons that we do not want our children going to college unless they are tailor-made for it. Number one, we want them to avoid the almost inevitable liberal indoctrination that awaits them on any college campus. Number two, we don't want them graduating up to their eyeballs, saddled in debt. Number three, we want to virtually guarantee them a job. And number four, and most attractive of all, we want to give the maximum amount of young Americans the chance to one day go and do the most American thing of all. Start their own business. Create wealth. Employ people. Achieve the American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, all of my life, the story of our 16th president, has propelled me forward. Lincoln was an ordinary man who became extraordinary. A common man who became an uncommon leader. Born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, grew up in Illinois. No elementary school, no middle school, no high school. No college education. Everything he learned, he taught himself. He was a physically strong man, a wrestler, who purportedly never, ever backed down from a fight. The qualities that define Abraham Lincoln, strength, character, courage, perseverance, they are the qualities that we need everywhere around us. Lincoln lost his mother. He lost his siblings. He lost three of his four children. He lost six elections. He failed in business. He had a poor relationship with his father. But Lincoln was a titan, and titans refuse to give up. Their hearts are somehow too big to fail, their passion too intense to deny, their spirit irrepressible. Yes, it's true. For one point, at one point, for six months, Lincoln could not get himself up out of bed, but he rallied and he scratched and he clawed and he crawled to get back up on his horse. Just one more round. Get up, he told himself. Again and again and again, Lincoln sprinted towards his dreams. He was unstoppable, unwavering, unyielding, relentless, a true force of nature. And in the end, despite all of the tragedy, Despite all of the misfortune, despite all of the disappointment, despite all of the loss, he rose to become President Abraham Lincoln, a man America needed at a most critical time, a man still very much in the political psyche more than 150 years after his death. So let the great lesson be to us in 2022 in this fight that we are in, that all of us in America can begin ordinary, but become extraordinary. That we can all start off common, but have an uncommon impact on the future of our nation. This year, the United States of America will celebrate her 246th birthday. It is a time for great celebration, but I would also submit it is time for sober and sombre contemplation. Because if you go and ask any historian worth their salt how long great nations tend to last, they'll tell you somewhere between 230 and 270 years. And that, my friends, puts America right in the kill zone. To make matters worse, for the first time, the enemies of the United States are no longer only foreign. They're also domestic. There are people within America rooting for America's failure, or worse, actively working towards that end. So the fight, the battle, the war, the struggle 
that we are going to have to embark on is going to be worse than any that we have been through before. It's going to require us to summon every ounce of patriotism from the soles of our feet to the tops of our heads. But as a lifelong student of American history, I remain unswervingly convinced that our best days still lie ahead. From the early defeats by Britain in the War of Independence to the loss of the Philippines to Pearl Harbor to the days following September 11, every single time America has been under attack, every single time America and freedom have been shoved up against a corner wall in a room, America has emerged bigger and stronger and better than ever before. It was Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French nobleman who came out here in the 18th century, who observed in his sociological masterpiece, Democracy in America, that the true genius of Americans lay in their ability to repair their faults. He noted the, quote, uncanny propensity of these people to re-correct a cultural trajectory. Sir Winston Churchill the great wartime Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the great wartime leader of, the, of the, the greatest figure of the 20th century, my lifelong political hero, half American himself, once similarly affectionately jibed that America always does the right thing after exhausting every other option. <laughs> and here I stand before you today as a third outsider telling you that I identify the same boomerang spirit, the same resilience in the American psyche. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something you already know, but you need to hear again. For the last 60 years, there has been a culture war raging in this country, but only one side has been fighting it. They've done it with lies, violence, the threat of violence, and the hostile takeovers of universities. They are dedicated to nothing short of our annihilation. And in the dogged pursuit of that singular objective, they are governed only by three things. The rules of Sol Alinsky, the morals of the Chicago mob, and the money of George Soros. <laughs> While this culture war has raged, we conservatives, we hard-working, regular, everyday, ordinary American men and women have been busy paying off our mortgages, growing our businesses, saving up our money to send our children off to college. And we have consistently and constantly and continually sought the high ground and elevated things like collegiality and dignity and propriety. To the point now we wake up in the morning, we almost choke on our bacon and eggs as we watch the morning television because we cannot believe what our eyes are seeing. The local high school is changing its name. The statue outside the courthouse that's been there for eons has been designated for removal. The elementary school two counties away has officially changed the school calendar to read from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Day in and day out, there is a relentless assault on American values a relentless assault on all of the things that you and I know and love. And it is for two reasons. Number one, all of the cultural institutions that shape and generate our culture are in the hands of people that want to fundamentally transform or in their most recent terminology, reset America. They don't love America the way that you and I love America. They don't love the things about America that you and I love about America. They want to transform America into something it has never been, something that it isn't, and quite frankly, something that it should never, ever become. Second reason is what I call the passion gap. Always hard to speak about publicly. But if we're going to have any chance of winning this fight, we need to be brutally candid with ourselves. So here it is. For the last 60 years, the left in this country have wanted to destroy America more than we have wanted to protect it. For the last 60 years, the left in this country 
have wanted to destroy America more than we have wanted to protect it. And ultimately what this boils down to is no different to a street fight. It's going to come down to who wants it the most. And until we can match them in intensity, in passion and in strategy, we are going to continue to lose all of those things that we hold so close to our heart. This is a war that we did not start, but it is a war that we have no choice but to finish. This is a war that we did nothing to provoke or invite, but this is a war that we have no choice but to attend. For where you sit and I stand is freedom's coliseum. Freedom will live or freedom will perish. Right here on this soil, the rest of the world is too far gone. And the pages of the history books yet to be written will reflect the actions that we determined to take at this juncture. Did we invest in the next generation of Americans? Did we insist on our citizens believing in American values? Or did we continue to permit our children to be brainwashed by European values? Did we make every conceivable effort to secure our elections? Did we make every conceivable effort to win our elections? Did we knock on every door? Did we speak to every neighbour? Did we do all of those things? Did we continue to be bullied and silenced and harassed and intimidated by political correctness and cancel culture? Or did we punch the bully in the nose and relegate it right where it belongs, on the dusty bottom bookshelf of some fourth-rate library in the middle of nowhere? These are the questions whose answers will determine what happens. But I want you to have hope because by virtue of the work that I do, I get to be in a different city almost every single day all across this incredible country. And I want you to know that there are patriots of the highest order in the unlikeliest of places fighting gallantly for our values. Let the history books record that in 2022, when faced with an unprecedented threat against America and freedom, that we responded with patriotism and gallantry, that we were unintimidated by the cultural elites, undaunted by the odds, and undeterred by the scale and magnitude of our fight. This is a fight that we can win, this is a fight that we must win. This is a fight that we will win. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. God bless Florida. God bless AMAC. And God bless the United States of America. Let's go out and kick some anti-American butt.